11 if you're using your hymn book praise the lord for the ambassador baptist college ensemble this morning in my heart there rings a melody on that first verse let's lift our voices i have a song that jesus gave me this morning. Thank you so much for being here in our heart. There should ring a melody, and I praise the Lord for salvation that uh, gives us that song, and thank you for being here with us. And if you're joining us via live stream, thank you so much for joining us. And if you're listening on the radio, uh, you're listening to Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church right here in Gray, uh, but today you'll have the privilege of hearing the ambassador uh, uh, from the Ambassador Baptist College, and you'll hear a singing group from their school, and then you'll also hear the president, Dr. Alton Beal, will be preaching for us, and 
at Ambassador Baptist College, if each of you get a chance to check it out online, their website is ambassadors.edu, and it's a great training ground for folks that are interested in serving the Lord with their life, and that is their focus, their laser-like in that, just to train servants of the Lord, and uh, they do a wonderful, wonderful job. And Brother Veal is a great friend and a a good friend of our church as well, and uh, many of you remember uh, Dr. Ron Comfort, which would have been his predecessor and started the college, and uh, Dr. Comfort still going strong, and we thank the Lord for the work of Ambassador Baptist College. But again, thank you for being here with us today. Let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless this service today, and may we certainly feel His presence. Dear Lord, we do ask You now to meet with us in a special way. Dear Lord, we're thanking You for the opportunity to be here. Lord, You gave us all the wherewithal to come in this morning. All of us have different varying Uh, activities this week. We have different circumstances that we've come through, but Lord, we have come through them. But I realize some of my family here is, Lord, still in the midst of it, but they got the strength to come on in this morning, and I'm so thankful that you gave them that. I pray that you do a work in every heart that's here today. I pray as Brother Beal preaches, dear Lord, you would minister to the hurting. I pray that you would lift up those that are downcast. I pray that you would encourage them, and I pray that you would use him in a special way. Use these young people. Thank you for the opportunity to gather. Bless us, please, is our prayer fervently from our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Brother Daniel's going to come, keep you up to date on a few things. Well, before we make any announcements, we want to welcome everybody to church this morning. We're so glad that you've decided to join with us today and uh, want to welcome all those who are special guests with us today. If you are a guest uh, here at church today, we're glad that you decided for whatever you normally would have been doing or maybe uh, normally would have been at, we're glad that you decided to come here this morning. Hopefully, as you came in this morning, you got a bulletin, and on that bulletin, there's a guest card. And if you wouldn't mind to take that card out and uh, and just fill it out with as much information as you're comfortable sharing, as you leave today, there's a guest services counter off to the left when you walk out of the auditorium. And if you wouldn't mind to go by there afterwards, you can drop that card off, but there'll be somebody there. They'd like to greet you and meet you. And we have a gift that we want to put in your hands. And that gift is just our way of thanking you for being a guest with us here this morning at church. And then by way of announcement, we just want to remind you about or let you know about a couple things as they're approaching. And uh, one is there's a trip going to the Bible printing ministry in Oliver Springs at Mount Pisgah. And uh, and that is on uh, March the 8th. And if you would like to be uh, part of that going there, there and helping uh, in that capacity. We're just going to come alongside that ministry. You can see Brother Dan uh, after the service uh, today or anytime really before uh, that comes and uh, get from, some more information from him. And then ladies, the ladies Bible study starts back up on March the 3rd. So if you've not gotten a book for that or you need some information about that, you can see Miss Amy in the uh, uh, lobby after the service. She'd be glad to answer your questions uh, regarding that as it comes. And uh, just want to encourage you, there's a lot of other things coming up uh, in the ministry. We have the uh, the Pinewood Derby coming up and some different uh, things. We've got a, a special missionary coming up uh, on March the 6th and Sunday, and I want you to be here for that. There's just a lot of different things, and uh, we try to make sure that everything uh, we do honors the Lord, but also something with some variety that you can uh, come, you can invite people to, you can look forward to, and so you don't want to miss a single Sunday because there's a lot going on at Buffalo Ridge, and we're so glad that you've decided to join with us today. Those are all of our announcements that we have for this morning, so let's all stand together as Brother Dan comes and leads us. 256 if you're using your hymnal. When I saw the cleansing fountain, oh, and why for all my sin, I will make the sinners free when he said.
one all that thrills my soul is Jesus. Who can cheer up like Jesus? Eyes and all divine. Good and tender, joy and precious.
Thank you so much, young people from Ambassador Baptist College. It's wonderful to have their ensemble here and then the strings to play for us for your uh, thing about the sweet hour of prayer. What a wonderful job they've done. And we want to thank the, uh, the staff that labors with them that came to direct. And we're grateful to have the college here. Um, I wanted to bring them this morning because I want us all to know about a wonderful place in a beautiful part of the country in uh, North Carolina that is there for the sole purpose of training young people for the ministry. And uh, they, have, they have got, as I mentioned, laser-like focus to train people with a heart for the Lord to get better at what God has called them to do and equip them to go out and serve in churches just like this. And uh, so Ambassador Baptist College is a friend to churches like ours that are Bible-believing, trying to do right, to win people to Christ, but keeping them God-honoring, Christ-honoring in their music and the way they outreach and things. And so we're so thankful for a place like 
Ambassador Baptist College. As I mentioned, please check them out online, ambassadors.edu. And uh, we're so thankful to, I'm grateful to have Brother Alton Beal as a friend of mine, but we're also thankful to have him come and preach for us today. So Brother Beal, would you come and uh, preach the Word of God, then take all the time you want to share with them some information about the college, about the book table out there, and we'll certainly be glad to hear. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor. Take your Bibles and join me in turning the book of Psalms this morning. We'll be in Psalm 85 here in a few moments. It's good to be back here at Buffalo Ridge. The last time I preached here, it was to an empty auditorium. I was looking at my notes. It was April of 2020. And uh, it sure is a blessing to see you here, and it's a blessing to see the auditorium. I'd seen pictures of it, but uh, to be able to see it in person. I know a lot of work went into this, and so I send you greetings from a fiery evangelist named Ron Comfort. Uh, Brother Comfort is preaching. Uh, he's been down in Florida a good bit, but we're going to see him uh, back in North Carolina for our Bible conference in the middle of March. And uh, I don't know of many churches that have as long a history with Ambassador as Buffalo Ridge. Uh, I came on the scene in 1992 as a student, had the opportunity to meet Brother Lastly. I remember traveling with a quartet and uh, getting to meet him in my early time as a student and uh, him preaching on a number of occasions. And uh, there are a number of you who share in our burden and praying and supporting the school. And I want to thank you for it. And you know, here we are 33 years later and we're still doing the same thing from day one and that's training God's servants for God's service. I'm going to tell you there's a great need for more preachers in this country. There is a great need for more preachers' wives in this country. There is a great need this morning for missionaries in the world. There is a need for people to go into the Lord's work. And I believe with all of my heart that God is still calling. These young people that are here before you this morning are evidence of that. But here's the greater question, are we listening? And I want to challenge everyone here, especially the younger generation. We were in the teen Sunday school. Uh, some people, they tell me, they say, Brother Bill, you think that every young man ought to be a preacher, and you think that every young lady ought to marry a preacher. I can understand why they think that, because it's a passion of mine. But I will tell you this, I do think every young man ought to be willing to go. And I think that every young lady ought to be willing to serve. And I'm telling you, the day in which we live is a ripe opportunity for people like Daniel to step on the scene and change the world. And so at Ambassador, that's what we're looking for. If you're here and God's called you to preach the gospel, you say, I'm going to be a pastor, an evangelist, a missionary, a youth pastor. You say, I can't preach, but I can sing and I want to work in church music. Or for the ladies, Christian elementary education, church ministries. Uh, missions and music. If, if any of those things appeal to you, come and see us at the table after the service. We're looking for ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Uh, in the last five years, I've gotten more phone calls, Pastor, for Christian school teachers than I can ever remember in my life. Uh, administrators and pastors calling me and saying, we want teachers that love the Lord, that love children, and love to go to church. <laughs> You know, they said, that's what we want. If we can get somebody who's skilled in teaching, that's who we want. There is plenty. There is plenty of opportunity uh, in the service of the Lord. And, I th and I, it's one of my passions. The longer I go, the greater I see the need. And so pray for us. At Ambassador, we'll be having a Bible conference here coming up at about the third week of March. Uh, we're excited about that. We'll be entering into our... Uh, graduation week, the first week of May. We'll look forward to seeing more laborers go out into the harvest during the summer. We'll send out a couple of evangelistic teams that will be in various churches and uh, have a summer ministry camp for grades 7 through 12. So if you're in that age bracket and you want to serve the Lord, missions, ministry, and music are the three tracks that we offer at that camp. We have a lot of fun. We eat a lot of great food. And we learn how to serve the Lord. And so uh, Camp Barnabas is something that's available for young people grades 7 through 12. That'll be in the middle of July. 
and uh, go to our website at ambassadors.edu and you can keep up to date with the things that are happening at the college. Uh, there are some materials on the back table. Some of you have seen Brother Comfort, our chancellor, his biography, or his autobiography, A Fire in My Bones. If you do not have that, it's a great story of the grace of God reaching down in the heart of a young boy that was uh, born, and, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, eventually transplanted to North Carolina. And God saved him at the age of 15 and used him as an evangelist to preach the gospel all over the world. And there's also some music items on the back table as well. So stop by and uh, see us and uh, take a prayer card, take an item that has our information on it, and uh, remember to pray for us at Ambassador Baptist College. All right, I hope I've given you enough time to find the book of Psalms. If I haven't, let me help you this morning. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and a long ways before that, uh, you get to the book of Psalms, right? Slap in the middle of the Old Testament. Psalm 85, I want to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? And verse 6 is our text. It says, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? And this morning I want to bring to you a message that I've entitled The Fourfold Question of Revival. You know, I think all of us have to be honest. The last two years have been a great challenge to churches in America. It's been a great challenge to pastors. It's been a great challenge to church members. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day when we will never hear the word COVID again. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe that even with all that we've experienced in the last two years in our country, it is high time for a word to take prevalence in our churches again that does not be begin with a C. I think that the need of the hour is no longer hearing about a pandemic. But the need of the hour in our churches is hearing this word, revival. I believe that it is time for God's people to turn their eyes off of their fears and their uncertainties and to set their eyes on God in a way unlike any time ever in their lives. And the subject is broached in Psalm 85, verse 6. The psalmist asks the question, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? And I think a word that we have lost a sense of is the word revival. You know, it's sad to say, but the world, when the world thinks of revival, it has been framed and shaped in large part by what they've seen in uh, uh, news documentaries. I remember years ago watching a news documentary either by ABC or NBC and it was supposedly publicizing the revival, a revival that took place in Florida and Toronto, Canada simultaneously. And to be quite honest, what they portrayed as revival to me was nothing more than foolishness. I remember watching it as people would roll in the aisles uncontrollably. And as they would roll in the, uh, the aisles uncontrollably, they were laughing to the top of their lungs. And they were talking about it being revival and being joyous in the Holy Spirit. And I thought to myself, well, if that's what the world sees and what the world calls revival, no wonder they don't want it. And what I saw in that documentary was so contrary to what I see in the Bible. Because I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when people get their eyes on God in a very concentrated way in the Bible, you don't find them rolling in the pews uncontrollably, but you find them like Isaiah on their faces saying, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And after they take a glimpse of God, they no longer can see themselves, and they stand up and say, Here am I, send me. 
And I really believe, ladies and gentlemen, that one of the reasons that we're seeing a famine of preachers in America today is because we have failed to take our eyes off of ourselves and to get our eyes on God because when a generation of young men gets their eyes upon God, they will rise up and say to that God, Here am I, send me, and go anywhere he bids. And ladies and gentlemen, if the church in America will refuse to be stirred about revival at this moment and in this day, I really question, will they ever be stirred? The psalmist said, Wilt thou not revive us again? You know, when I read about revival and when I read just God really dealing in the hearts of men in the, New, in the Old and New Testament, there's several characteristics. Now, this is by way of introduction. Don't get worried. This message has a large porch. And thankfully, it's not a 5,000 square foot house, all right? But just by way of introduction, can I tell you that when I read the Bible and I see God working mightily in the hearts of men, number one, I see an intense sense of God's presence. Now, I fully am aware that as believers, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit of God indwells us, and it's high time for all of us to live like that. But can I tell you, there is something to having a sense of God's presence. Moses longed for it in Exodus 33 and verse 14. God said to Moses, my presence shall go up with thee and I will give thee rest. And Moses, now listen to what Moses said to God. Moses said, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. You see, Moses was acting like a little child who says, I don't want to go if dad's not going. I don't want to go if mom's not going. I'm afraid that we Christians, sometimes we lose a sense of God's presence and we expect us to follow Him instead of, instead of us, or we expect Him to follow us instead of us following Him. When revival comes and God moves mightily in the hearts of people, there's also a deep heart searching and confession of sin. In Ezra chapter 9 and verse 6, Ezra said, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up into the heavens. He had a great sense of the sinfulness of his people. I'm afraid that we in our churches sometimes we're a lot more aware of the sin in our societies than our society than the sin that's in our pews. I think for us to see God do a mighty work and to do a great awakening, that there needs to be a reviving that takes place in the church. In which we have a great awareness of where we're at. And listen, maybe for some of us, we look back over the last two years and we say, you know, I have lost some ground spiritually. Listen, this is the time to gain it back. But you know, when revival comes, there's a deep, or excuse me, there's a renewed appreciation for God's Word. You know, here we are, we live in the Bible Belt. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. There are more people illiterate when it comes to the Bible in this city and in this area of Tennessee than there's probably ever been. The Bible is less and less familiar to many people. You see, when I was a kid, you could go to the old farmer that was just as lost as could be, raised by a God-fearing mother, and he knew all the Bible stories, but there's so many people that are unfamiliar with it now. And I'm afraid one of the reasons it's unfamiliar in our communities is because we've taken it for granted in our churches. When Evan Roberts preached a revival in the nation of Wales in the early 1900s, he stood before a congregation one night, and you know what he did? He, all he did was quote Romans chapter 5, verse 8. He stood before those people and he said, But God commendeth His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And at the conclusion of quoting that verse, saint and sinner alike came forward under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Sinners came to be saved, overwhelmed by the love of God. Christians came to be comforted in knowing that God loved them so much. 
And yet we quote a verse like that today and people roll their eyes and say, I've heard it. And I'll tell you, the problem's not with the Bible. The problem's with our familiarity with it. And for revival to come, we have to be shaken out of that. But for revival to come, there's also a deep spiritual awakening among Christians. A tiredness of being mechanical. Listen, I'm all for order. I'm all for an order of service. When I come as a ch in a church as a preacher, I always enjoy knowing what's going on, when I'm supposed to come. I, I'm not against an order. But I'll tell you, when we do the same things over and over and over again, and we become mindless, and instead of worship, it is mechanics, listen to me, we're in desperate need of revival. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, And that knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation near. Then when we believe the night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And so I want to bring before you this morning in the few moments that we have left the fourfold question of revival. If you're wondering about the future of America, I'll tell you what the future of America hinges upon, whether or not God's people posture themselves to be ready for revival. In other words, I believe that all of us that are sitting in this room that are saved by the grace of God, there is a great sobering message, and that is, do we want revival, and are we willing to seek God for it? So the first thing that I want you to see is I want you to see that this question in verse 6 is a question of realization. He says, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? It is a question of realization. You say, what do you mean? Listen, no man asks God for revival just in a casual way. I mean... Oh, you know, we talk about the weather, we ask about the weather, we ask about sports. But listen, no man is going to ask God for a reviving or a revival just casually. He has to realize a couple things in his heart. The first thing that he has to realize is he has to realize his need for revival. Let me just say, no man's ever going to pray for revival. No man's ever going to seek for revival unless he thinks he needs it. You know, here in the South, we have this thing. We say you can't get a man saved until, first of all, you get him what? Lost. You say, what do you mean? You go up to somebody and you say, you going to heaven. They say, well, I've been to church all my life. Oh, my grandpappy was a preacher. Well, I'll tell you what, we used to go to those homecomings, and boy, the food sure was good. Hey, I wasn't asking you, were you a member of a church? I wasn't asking you, was your grandpa a preacher? Was Jesus, Jesus Christ your Savior? That's the question. And I'm going to tell you, drunkenness has blinded many people, but religion has done far more blinding, I'm afraid, in the day and time we live in. And my friend, if you're here today and you're saying, well, I'm in church this morning, that'll get me there, listen to me. No, it won't. This room's filled with a bunch of people that have fallen short. Every last one of us is preacher included. And there's only one who can make up the gap. His name, Jesus Christ. But there are a lot of people today, they say, well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I think I'm good. And the problem is, is they don't even realize that they're lost. Well, let me tell you something. Just like no man's going to get saved until first of all he's going to get lost, listen to me. No person is ever going to pray for revival unless he thinks he needs it. And I really believe that perhaps one of the greatest obstacles to revival in 2022 is very simply this. We don't want to say it, but it's where we're at. We don't think we need it. We're living more comfortably financially than we... Listen, I know there's inflation. But the truth is, every person in this room, listen to me, every last one of us, we're richer than 80% of the world. You say, brother, I, I'm living on a limited income. I'm talking about you too. All of us, when you look at this big blue marble, I'm going to tell you, we're nothing but blessed. And we have become so comfortable. 
And the comfortableness that we have felt has caused, that com- has caused us to be comfortable in a spiritual sense. We'll never pray for revival unless we think we need it. You say, well, I, I'm a preacher, I'm a Sunday school teacher, I'm a deacon. Well, why don't you just throw this? I'm a college president, I'm an evangelist, and I don't care what your position is or mine. Listen, all of us could stand for a little reviving. Several years ago, my wife had to go get a root canal, and I remember uh, making a few car payments for that dentist. And a few weeks later, I looked at my wife. I said, honey, I said, uh, what was the name of that dentist that uh, you went to? And she told me the name, and she looked at me, and she said, why is that? I said, well, I've got something that hurt me and bothered me. And I remember going to that dentist, and he looked, and he said, sure enough, you've got a cavity. We're going to have to drill down there, and we're going to have to fill it. And drill he did. I thought he was trying to strike oil for a little bit. just kept going and going and going. You know what? No man is ever going to ask for a dentist unless he thinks he needs one. At least sane people, that's the way it goes. But I'm going to tell you what. No saved person is ever going to ask God for revival until you think you need it. And if I could back up for just a moment, my friend, if you're here this morning and you're lost, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'll tell you what will cause you to run to the cross, and that's when you see yourself before God lost and undone and laden with guilt, and you realize that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man can come to the Father but by Him. And when you come to that conclusion and you see the awfulness of your mess, and you see what God has done for you, listen to me, then you're proud to run to the cross. So I want to ask you, when's the last time it ever occurred to you that maybe you need revival? I'm ashamed to admit it, but I'll tell you something about myself that I have a suspicion it's true of a lot of us in this room. We're really good at seeing the needs of others, aren't we? (laughs) He needs revival. If he'd get here half the time, it, it sure would help him. I'm going to tell you, that woman back there, she needs revival. Falls asleep during church and gossips and everything. She needs it. We're really good at looking at everybody else, but I'm going to tell you, the Bible tells us this. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. James chapter 4 and verse 10. I don't think God was saying, why don't you humble everybody else? I think God was saying, why don't you humble yourself? Never one time in the Bible does God ever command me to be proud. There's two reasons for that. Number one, it's sin. He'd never tell me to do wrong. Number two, it comes so easy I don't have to be told. But folks, I'm going to tell you, until we are willing to humble ourselves, listen, until we're willing to see the need for revival, listen, we're not even on the threshold. We're not even on the doorstep. But not only did he realize the need for revival, but he realized the source of revival. Wilt thou not revive us again? One of the, I, you know, I went to Bible college because I was called to preach, and I wanted to learn all I could about the Bible. And the thing I loved about Bible college is I didn't have to take history of civilization, algebra, geometry. Why, why waste your life doing that, right? When you're a preacher anyway. But you know what? There was one class that I could not escape, and it, well, I'll tell you what, it was my Achilles heel. You say, what, what class was that? It was English. <laughs> you say, why do they require English in a Bible college? Well, that is the language you're preaching in. And I still remember my patient English teacher, her name Mrs. Rosenau. Mrs. Rosenau taught me all the things that the public school English teacher didn't. And one of the things she taught me was that when you have a pronoun, that pronoun has an antecedent. You say, what in the world do you mean? If I said, he hit me, and pastor was the one that hit me, then pastor is the antecedent. In other words, that's what the pronoun is referring to. All right, class, here's my question. When the Bible says, wilt thou, 
not revive us again, who is it referring to? God. Wilt thou, God, not revive us again? And we are pointed to the source of revival. Let me tell you, no personality is the source of revival. The other day I made the mistake of watching a preacher who has long forfeited his right to be a preacher. A man that I would hear quote sometimes upwards to 50 to 60 verses of the Bible in one message and now preaches such a mess that you can't even tell that it's the same person. Let me tell you something, people change. And I'm afraid that in a lot of churches today, in a lot of places, and I'll just say it just, just in general, we are caught up in personalities. I'm going to tell you, you can raise every famous preacher from the dead, put them in the same room, and they still can't bring revival. You know when revival comes? Revival comes when we realize it's not a person, it's not a program or a preacher, it's not a program that brings it, but it's God. He is the source of it. So I want to ask you a question. When's the last time you personally have realized your own need for revival? We'll never ask God for it if we don't think we need it. But the second thing that I want to show you is not only is it a question of realization, but it is a question of repetition. Wilt thou not revive us again? You know what the psalmist was doing? The psalmist was asking God to do something that he had done before. It's that simple. Do you know what the word again means? My son Andrew, when he was two years old, we were out in California. I was doing some preaching with a college group. We were in a different church every night for eight weeks. And I remember my son Andrew, we were on a long drive. We got out of the van, and the first thing he wanted to do was run around and play. And so I grabbed that boy up by the arms, and I began to swing him around and around and around and around where his legs are out from under him, and he's just wide open. He was having a ball, and I was too, until all of a sudden my world started getting very dizzy. You know what I'm learning? The older you get, the quicker you get dizzy. Those amusement parks that brought me glee at the age of 17 now torment me. But I remember I had that boy and I was spinning him around and around and around. He was just a squealing. I started getting dizzy and I realized I better slow this train down or it's going to be bad. And I stopped and his knees drugged the ground. And when he stopped, no sooner than we stopped, that little boy looked up at me, shot his hands up in the air and he said, again, again. I gave him a second ride and it didn't last half as long as the first one. I hadn't recovered from that dizziness. But I'll tell you what, a two-year-old boy, if he can understand what the word again means, I would hope every adult in this room could. In my evangelist class, I've been teaching on the Great Awakenings. We've covered the first Great Awakening that took place right before the Revolutionary War. We studied the second one that took place on the tail ends of that all the way up until 1850. Now here's my question for you. Do you believe, do you honestly believe that God can do a great work in 2022? I think a lot of us know what the right answer is, but I don't know that we believe it. You know, I've always believed the devil's our enemy, and I know he's our great enemy, and he's our greatest enemy. But I'm going to tell you another enemy that's in the church, we don't like to acknowledge it, it's called unbelief. Do you believe that God can work in a time when transgendered thinking is, popula or is popularized in society? Do you think God can work in a day in which there's gender confusion? 
Do you think that God can work in a day where there's political corruption to the hilt? Do you think that God can work in a time in which we have seen wickedness exalted more than we ever have perhaps as, our, as Americans? I talk to some people and they'll say, I just don't believe God will or that God can. By the way, I would be careful about saying what God can't do. God can't lie, but outside of that, there's not a whole lot else to say. And there are some people, they have set in their minds a fatalistic attitude. And what have they done? They have looked at their circumstances and let that dictate their hope and let it define their God. And that's a mistake. And if you're here and you say, Preacher, I don't care what you say. I don't think that God can do a mighty work in our day. Then all I ask you to do is read the Old Testament. Can I tell you when Ezra and Hezekiah and Nehemiah and Isaiah, when you see where they were all at in history, can I tell you they were in bad shape? Now, Israel was as a nation. We talk about abortion. Can you imagine Israel? There was child sacrificing taking place. Babies thrown into the fire and the beating of drums to drown out the screams of those infants. You say, that is horrible. You're right. It was a horrible time. But some people turned their hearts to God. And I believe this morning that, listen, after two years of sort of feeling like we're in a drought and sort of being in a rut, listen to me, it's high time for God's people to take notice of one word, and that's the word again. If you're here and you say, listen, after the last ten minutes, I don't care, preacher. I don't think that God can do that again in our day and time. I'm going to invite you to do something after church then. If you're going to be that bold and brazen, then I'm going to ask you to do something with a little boldness myself. I want you to go out to your car after the service. Don't do it in here. I want you to open your Bible to Psalm 85, verse 6, and I want you to take a pen that's as black as you can find. And I want you to scribble that word again right out. Just, I mean, just as dark as you can. Now, some of you look at me and you say, Now, preacher, have you never read the book of the Revelation? There's a curse to those who add and take away from it. You realize what you just asked us to do? You know what I, I do, and I've really done it tongue-in-cheek. But can I ask you a question? What's the difference between sitting in a pew and acting like God can't do it again or sitting in your car and marking it out of your Bible? I think for a lot of us as God's people, we've got to do a little heart searching and it wouldn't hurt us to believe God again. Now, I'm not talking about living in the past. You know, I, we can look back and we can talk about the heydays that were there and listen, that we've all had those. All I know is, is I live in 2022 and I need God to work now. That's where I'm at. And I believe God can. But we have lost hope. We have been paralyzed by fear. We've been paralyzed by uncertainty. And it's high time, instead of letting our circumstances dictate whether or not we think that God can do something, let's let this book determine that. Are you willing to change your mind and trust God to do something again? It's a question of repetition. Number three, it's a question of intercession. It's just simply a prayer. That's what verse six is. He asks God a question. Have you ever asked God a question? I know sometimes prayer is being on your knees and, and being on your face before God and just talking to Him. But you know, sometimes, I mean, really prayer, I, there's just been times I've been doing something, I just ask God a question. I remember one time I was walking down the street in our small town that we live in. We had a neighbor who was a farmer who had two demon-possessed dogs. You say, were they really? They seemed like it to me. But every time I'd walk by, those dogs would just come right up the edge of the road and just, just show their teeth and just be as nasty as could be. 
And I remember one day I was over at the college, I was going to walk to the house, and I had to walk by there, and on my way, I just stopped. I'll never forget it that night. I just stopped, and I looked up to heaven, and I said, Lord, I know you're there. I said, would you please just let those dogs be quiet? I don't want to hear it tonight. I really don't. And I remember walking by the farmer's house as I was coming to the edge of the property. I was just waiting. Those two dogs were sitting underneath a light or a pole there with a light on top. And instead of doing their tr usual tradition that night, I remember those two dogs, they just sat there and the whole time they looked at me like this. Now, I really believe when I get to heaven and say, Lord, I'd like to see the whole picture of that, there's probably three angels on each of them holding them there, just twisting their heads so that they won't come. But I, I do. I remember that night. I, it, it was a prayer. It was just really an informal one, but I just asked God a question. I wonder what would happen if we begin to sense the need in our own lives for God to do something great and we started asking God the same question. Isn't it true you have not because you ask not? <coughs> I wonder. I just wonder what would happen if we would again see that God can do something and we just ask Him, Lord, will you not revive us again? It's a question of intercession. But the last thing that I want you to see is that it's a question of expectation. What happens when God works mightily in the hearts of men? Well, notice the end of verse 6 that thy people may rejoice in thee. <clears throat> you want to be happy or do you want to be sad? You want to be depressed or do you want there to be joy in your heart? I'll tell you what determines a lot of that. You know what it is? Here it is. It's very simple. Whether or not you let God have His way. You know some of the darkest people I've ever met have been those who've just shut God out of their lives. Some of the unhappiest people I've ever met were those that just shoved God away. Some of the unhappiest people I've ever met are Christians who've said, that's it, you know what, I'm just not listening anymore. But you know what happens when you let God have His way? There's rejoicing. My friend, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior, I wish all of you could have been in the teen Sunday school to listen to Drew, Drew Haynes' testimony this morning. One of our young men gave a testimony about how he came to Bible college and his salvation had not been nailed down. And God used the testimony of another girl in the personal evangelism class of all the things. You know how she, how she came to know the Lord? She found a gospel presentation on YouTube. You know how miraculous? That's like finding a needle in a haystack. You're like, well, our church, we put... Some, well, I, I know that, but you, you know when you consider all the mess that's on there for somebody to try to look up something and to find a legit gospel presentation, he hears this girl's testimony, and you know what happens? He says, Lord, I, I need to get this nailed down in my heart. And he trusts Christ as his Savior. You know what happens when you listen to God in those circumstances? There's rejoicing. And I'm telling you, there may be some of you this morning, you are fighting God, you're either unsure, you know that you're not saved. Listen, you could leave this place rejoicing if you'd humble yourself. But you know what? God's people, when they get their eyes on the things of the Lord, you know what happens? There's rejoicing among them as well. Do you know when revival hit Wales, you know what happened? Gambling and alcohol lost their trades. Hey, get this, soccer games were forgotten. Could you imagine nobody showing up for the Super Bowl because they wanted to be in church? That happened in the early 1900s. When revival came, listen, people began to be excited about spiritual things. 
When's the last time you as a Christian, you were excited about something spiritual? You know, all of us, we, we get excited. Some of you are Tennessee fans. You get excited when your team wins. Some of you say that's very infrequently. Well, I know the feeling over North Carolina. We have the same problem sometimes. You know, some of you ladies, you're like, I don't do sports. All right, you find a good deal, a clearance, and you're like, hey, honey, I just saved us $200 today. What you didn't tell them is you spent $300 to save $200, but we know how that goes. Listen, every person in this room, you know what it means to rejoice. You know what it means to be happy. When's the last time something transpired in your life or the life of somebody that you loved and you said, man, that was great? I remember years ago I was preaching in South Carolina. At the end of the service, there was a young man who got saved. He stood before the entire congregation. He gave testimony of his salvation. And when he did that, that day, I'm telling you, it was so quiet. I couldn't believe it. Now, I will tell you, I was born and raised in Yadkinville, North Carolina. Some of you are saying, you think we ought to all hang off the chandeliers. Well, I, I, listen, I, I, I understand some have more dignity than others, all right? And I'm not the kind that says, boy, you know, we have to run a pew and throw a handkerchief everywhere. I, I'm not of that crowd, but I will tell you another crowd that I'm not a part of, and that's the mortuary crowd. Folks, I couldn't believe it. This man got saved. And it hardly was a holy grunt or even an affirming smile. And we got out in the church vestibule area. As soon as the last amen was said, people were talking about South Carolina and Clemson and how they were going to have a great afternoon. Am I against sports? No. I, you know what? They probably are a source of aggravation for me because my teams always lose. Am I against having fun? No. But I'm going to tell you something. When you compare something that God does with something man does, there's no comparison. And folks, we have been lulled into being entertained by the world and bored with God. I realize that we don't come to these conclusions overnight. I can't just flick a switch in your heart and mine and say, well, let's all be persuaded for revival. But ladies and gentlemen, if we don't start thinking about it and we don't start pondering it and get our eyes back on the Lord like we need to, listen, this country and our churches will continue their slide. And so I want to challenge you this morning. If you've not prayed it in a long time, that you'd say, Lord, wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee. I'll tell you what, when God answers that prayer, your church will be better for it. Your family will be better for it. This college will be better for it. And you will be better for it. Would you be willing to leave this service this morning letting God have His way in your heart? Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to ask you this question. <clears throat> I wonder if there are people in this room today and you'd say this. You'd say, Brother Bill, one of two things is true. I am either not sure or I know that I'm not saved. There may be a teenager who was in the testimony time this morning. You heard Drew's testimony and you'd say, you know what, that's exactly where I'm at. Uh, there may be somebody here in this crowd, you say, I know that I need to be saved. I know you're preaching about revival to the church, but you'd say, preacher, I know that I need to be saved. Let me tell you, you ought to seek the Lord while He may be found. If God's knocking in your heart, don't delay. Today's the time to open the door. 
And I wonder if there'd be people here today and you'd say this, you'd say, Preacher, I'm either not sure that I'm saved or I know that I'm not saved. And if there's going to be any rejoicing in my life, I know that I need to come to Jesus. And you'd say, Preacher, would you pray for me this morning? I'm either not sure or I know that I'm not saved. Preacher, would you pray for me? If that's you, would you just slip your hand up right now? Slip it up high enough for me to see it. I'll acknowledge it and you can put it right back down. Would you do that as I look in the balcony, as I look on the main floor? You'd say, Preacher, I need to be saved. That's my need. All right. I wonder if there'd be some of us today and you'd say, Brother Bill, after listening to the message, I'd have to say it's probably been a long while since I've been personally convinced of my own need for revival. I may be talking to some, there's so many other things right now in the forefront of your mind, you'd say, you know, revival really hasn't even scratched the surface. I wonder if there'd be Christians here today and you'd say, Brother Beal, I know I'm saved. But I think God's beginning to work in my own heart about my own need for revival. God's trying to show me. And you would say, Preacher, would you pray that God would continue that work in my heart? If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Are there Christians like that? There's several here. Yes. God bless you. Thank you. You may put them down. Anybody else along with these? Thank you. Young and old alike. In just a few moments, we're going to stand together. And after I have a word of prayer, our instruments will begin to play. And I would just encourage you to start looking back to that word that we desperately need. That's the word revival. And believe God for it. Maybe some of you have been disillusioned and discouraged. And today there's one word you needed to hear and that's the word again. And I want to challenge you to begin praying that prayer that the psalmist prayed many years ago, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. I hope you will. If you're able, would you join me in standing? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you join me in standing this morning? Father, Lord, I thank you for your patience with us, and I thank you, Lord, for your everlasting, enduring love. And God, I pray that you'd bring your people along, all of us, Lord, that you'd help us to see the great need that we have in our hearts. Lord, help us not to live with fear and doubt. Lord, help us not to live with a love for the past that causes us to believe that you can't work in the future. And Lord, may we leave this place today as a congregation, as a people persuaded that you can do a reviving work, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as our instruments begin to play. If God's working in your heart this morning and you need to come, I invite you to do so. You say, I need that prayer to be made in my life. Well, then I encourage you to come. You say, preacher, I'll be honest, I've gotten some just depressed and disillusioned. <clears throat> I've got my eyes focused on so many different things. And today, God has shown me there is a need in my heart. And yes, God can do a work. Some of us here, we've let pessimism reign in our hearts. We've confined God to a box. Listen, we need God to work in our churches. We need God to work in our families. We need God to work in our lives. And we need to ask Him to revive us. You know, the future is always bright when God is in it and God is a part of it. And I have hope. I believe it's possible for God to do a reviving work in our churches, our youth groups, even our Christian colleges. It's one that we need. In just a moment, we'll be done. But I want you to leave here with some hope. I want you to leave here with a belief that God can work in our day. And that God can use folks just like you to do so. All right, you can look this way. 
pastor's going to come and dismiss us here in just a moment, but I do want to encourage you, please stop by the table and uh, learn a little bit more about Ambassador. And if you already know about us, please visit our website. Pray for us as we train God's servants for God's service. I'm so glad that the Reams, uh, Dwayne Reams, the music chairman, leading our music group today is with his wife, Candy, and then one of our music faculty members, Drea Wagner, playing the piano and uh, helping us as well. So we look forward to seeing you after the service. Please meet, talk with the young people, and uh, pray for us as we continue to train God's servants for God's service. Pastor. Well, amen. Thank you so much, Brother Beal, for being our guest, and thank you, young people, for being here and, and faculty as well. And I trust you've been blessed today. I know that uh, the truths that were preached were a benefit to me because, to be honest with you, you get just caught up in all that's going on, and you kind of forget to pray and forget to seek the Lord. You think, like he just said, everybody else needs a lot of that, but uh, me and the Smith boys over here, we both amen him and helped him along because we both, we all three of us, we knew that we needed it, and I heard many of you amen as well to see, as, as we saw that need today presented, we got to have some help from the Lord to see this thing revived before it all goes down, and we want to see the Lord work. Thank you for being in church today. I hope that you fellowship with one. I'm going to let the young people, whoever's manning the table, I don't know which ones are, uh, they can slip out, and um, then Brother Beal will be out there. I'll be out there uh, as well. If you need anything, we'll certainly be around, but uh, thank you so much for being in church. I invite you back at 630. I want to preach a message about your heart and uh, hearing the being close to the heart, rather, of Jesus Christ and uh, hearing his heartbeat, and I trust it'll be a blessing to you. Please be in prayer one for another. Thank you for being in church. God bless. You're dismissed.